Total Annihilation was originally created by Cave Dog Entertainment, a subdivision of Humongous, and released by GT Interactive. Out of context, we can't really talk about Total Annihilation without mentioning Humongous and Cave Dog, so let's do a small backtrack trip. Yamanga's entertainment can be traced back to Ron Gilbert and Charlie Day, both former employees at Lucasfilms, which will later become known as LucasArts. Ron Gilbert was a game designer, programmer and producer for Lucasfilms games, where he co-wrote Scum, script creation utility for Maniac Mansion, a video game engine developed for point-and-click games for the Commodore 64. Scum got the name for Maniac Mansion, or vice versa, I really can tell. The interface style for Maniac Mansion was way ahead of his time, the advantage of this new interface was that it would eliminate the inconvenience of a text parser used in the so-called interactive fiction games, where you had to guess the text that needed to be input to progress the story. With Scum, the test key was a set of common verbs displayed at the bottom of the screen. The player could create sentences and then commands by selecting a verb and then clicking on an object in the game graphics. This removed the necessity of test typing guesses. Ron ended up by co-creating and co-producing several other successful games, such as Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and the well-known franchise games The Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2 The Chuck's Revenge, which used a similar version of the scum but with more advanced graphics, since they were originally released for the Amiga system. After 8 years working with LucasArts, in March 1992, and with Gilbert eager to put his skills to use in a different segment of the gaming market, he co-founded a software company called Yamangas Entertainment with Charlie Day. The main purpose was to create adventure games for kids in what was called at the time, entertainment. In the next years, Yamangas created several successful franchises for kids, which increased his business and made the company to become one of the most successful in the branch. With a well-established software company and with the existence of capital, Gilbert will be able to invest on a different branch for his company, one that will result in the creation of Cave Dog Entertainment. Chris Taylor had his first computer bought by his dad when he was 40 years old, a TRS-80, which he used to get a computer science award. He soon realized that he wouldn't be using a PC to run applications and games, but to develop his own software. Since, at the age of 17, he had already programmed a database for a taxi company, he eventually ended up by finding an ad for C and assembly programming for Vancouver's distinctive software, now known as Electronic Arts Canada. It was a respected game design firm at the time, already known for its simulation games like Hardball and Test Drive. The advertisement promised 40000 a year, but it wasn't exactly like that. I went in and got interviewed for the job, and things went pretty smoothly. They offered me the position and said, congratulations, you're on board at 24000 a year. Although it wasn't quite as advertised, I was just happy to get my foot on the door of the industry. While working at Distinctive Software, Chris ended up by developing at least four games. Hardball 2, which was relieved in 89 and won the Software Publishers Association Award for the best sport game of the year, 4D Boxing and Triple Play Baseball 96. The last game programmed by Taylor was Virtua Man, a game which ended up by never being released. It was at this time that he decided that it was more than time to start programming games he would actually want to play. Though Taylor had been programming sport games, in his spare time, he always preferred different type of games. While I was building all those baseball games, I was actually playing all the real-time strategy titles. Ever since I was 14, I wanted a few things in a game. Explosions, tanks and a lot of excitement, energy and epic battles. A game like Command & Conquer epitomized everything I ever wanted. However, to build this dream, there were two things he needed. A company and money. Taylor considered building his own development house in Canada, but due to the difficulties he will face to do so, he ended up by calling some friends he knew in the industry. One of those friends was Shelley Day. Taylor knew Shelley since he had been the producer of the first game Taylor did, Hardball 2, when he worked at Distinctive Software. She promptly set up a dinner between Taylor and Ron Gilbert. We were in September 1995. Dane Gilbert founded the new Nameless Studio shortly after Chris Taylor started working at Yamangas in December 1995. While Taylor further evolved his ideas for what he called a really cool war game in his paper draft, a pivotal member would soon join his studio. Around April 1996, Squaresoft Incorporated, a subsidiary of Square Company Limited, 
had just closed his doors, laying off several well-educated game designers and programmers, and one of them was Clayton Kozlerick. Clayton Kozlerick joined the game industry in 1992. He started as a production artist at Manly and Associate, a video game developer from Seattle who developed games for Electronic Arts, Activision, Disney, Game Tech, amongst others. Kozlovic worked as a background artist and animator on a number of PC and console titles. Among these games were Pink Goes to Hollywood, a publisher at Tech Magic, and he also created the interface art and backgrounds for Pitfall, the Mayan Adventure. Before leaving Squaresoft, Kozlovic also worked as an animator for popular RPG Secret of Evermore, also for Super Nintendo Entertainment System. He also worked with fellow co-workers, which would later also join Cavedog. Kozlovic was sure he was in the right place. I interviewed for a lot of production jobs that would have been pretty secure, but being the lead artist on Chris Taylor's game was a truly amazing opportunity. Taylor also remembers the humble beginnings of the game development along with Kozlovic. We started by building a small demo of a polymesh ground, since he wanted to first experiment with the use of the 3D terrain in an RTS. In this demo, you could pull the points on the ground and stretch the elevation of the terrain. There were also some 3D boxes that would roll around the hills. Though it was very simple, at the same time it showed exactly how the engine would work and proved that Taylor's idea could be turned into reality. Taylor had been prototyping the engine since the autumn of 1995. He had already spent considerable effort studying weapon systems and battle tactics, specifically the key strategic elements of elevation when employing heavy ordnance. I wanted to create a game where controlling high ground really mattered, and that if you hit on higher ground you could protect yourself from certain kinds of projectiles. Clayton soon decided that the wreckage from destroyed vehicles should also remain on the battlefield to simulate as realistically as possible some more documentaries he was watching at the time, where vehicles could block other units, and also that the unit count you could control should be much higher than in Command and Conquer, for instance. When Total Annihilation was released, the maximum unit count was around 50 to 100 units, with official and unofficial patches it could reach around 250 and 5000 units, which in due time ended up by resulting in ridiculous battle sceneries. Along the game development, Taylor was convinced that much more use could be made of the minimap in Total Annihilation. This is when he decided to implement a way for players to be able to use a small map screen to know unit's location, both friend or foe, by adding the possibility for a player to build a radar tower that would be able to detect units within its radios, even if their location still hadn't been discovered and they were still covered by fog of war. However, there was a countermeasure, a radar jammer. Both gameplay features were groundbreaking at the time. One of the most receptive main game ideas implemented in the development was the multiple tweaks that could be performed related with the fog of war, since at the time everyone had a different opinion about how it should work and set up. At a certain time period the studio decided to include all the options they could think of so people playing multiplayer games could configure it to their liking. As for attention to detail, the radar screen would also show the fired projectiles, which Taylor considered a simple yet important addition. I coded that in 5 minutes, I was like, whoa, people are gonna love that. At this time, the really cool war game was still missing a name, which, following Coswick, was decided from when they were doing a unit behavioral graphic test demo, where they noticed everything was exploding all over the place, so the name Total Annihilation seemed like the obvious choice. With Taylor's engine and Coswick's visual style in place, the game slowly started to take shape. Coswick also remembers that in order for all these ideas for the game concept to be developed, the team was slowly built up, while he and Taylor created the tools, which following him were key for how the game was developed with the rest of the team. Using those tools, they ended up by creating around 100 unique units in the next coming months. Besides the several developments needing to be tweaked regarding the numerous type of units which had been created, at this time, they had already come up with the concept of the commander, and were still in the process of defining which vehicles would belong to each faction. Factions, which were still nameless, the lore and history for each side were still to be created, but the main units and the way they were to operate was already in more advanced stages of development. The concept they came up with was that every new game would always start with a commander, which was used to build other units. The commander would have great energy attack 
and when it dies, it would result in a huge explosion. Like any other real-time strategy game from the 90s, the idea was to build your base and gather resources, which in Total Annihilation were energy and metal. However, contrary to other popular RTSs at the time, which required units to gather the required resources, in Total Annihilation, all you needed to do was to build the extracting structures where those resources were found. After that, all you had to do was wait for nanotechnology to do its work. Following what was mentioned before, Kozlovic explains on his blog how the decision was made. As for the nanotech, at the time we were trying to figure out how to portray construction in the game. It would have been too complex and time consuming to have little guys with hammers and scaffolds every time something was built in the game. It also wasn't futuristic enough. We needed something like magic, but with a thin veneer of science around it. Nanotechnology to the rescue. Amongst the hundreds of units developed during and after the game production, a variety of units for both sides. They range from infantry, vehicle, ship and air. With so many unit types in each category, the production for each specific unit had a handicap associated with each one. While simple units could be pumped out quickly, the larger, tougher units will take some more minutes to build. Total Annihilation also implemented the possibility to increase production time by having multiple construction units to build the required infrastructure in the lower time period. As an example, a radar tower could be built simultaneously by a commander, a keybot, a construction vehicle, an aircraft, a construction overcraft, or a construction seaplane. At 9 July 1996, GT Interactive purchased the Among Us for about 75 million. At this time, a quick demo was also shown to some GT executives, which were excited with what they saw. What further fueled their full support in the game development, Cave Dog Entertainment was still a name to be invented. GT Interactive was also one of the reasons why most of the new team members were added between 96 and 97. Following Kozlerik's previous example, most of the members started joining the team around the summer of 1996, some months after Squaresoft had shut down their offices in Redmond. At the fall of 1996, the team was already composed of around 20 members and things were taking place. Though all of them had huge importance, some members you can mention besides Gilbert, Taylor, and Kozlovic were Kevin Pun, Jeremy Soule, John Maver, Rick Lambright, and Jacob McMahon. During the last months of 96 and the spring of 1997, when the team would finish implementing the 3D engine, the game lore, and unit type and behavior, which was Taylor and Kozlovic's top priority, since they assumed that while the 3D engine was impressive, it would become a very standard thing during 1997, so they were relying on the innovative and original gameplay elements they had implemented and would finish implementing to separate them from the other studios. And this is where Kozlerik's systematic artistic approach paid off, as he pushed over trying to create a game with realistic physics and unit behavior. Every other RTS had what I call iconic representations of unit, but in TA, the units are more realistic because they move and animate according to the environment. As an example, the turret on a tank would actually spin, turn and elevate to obliterate enemy forces and as a tank rolls over a hill, it would actually pitch and yaw. Jacob McMahon was an organizational genius largely responsible for most of Total Annihilation's units and unit behavior, which were represented in amazing simulated 3D. Behind those 3D concepts, the ambitious 3D engine had to be written from scratch. Jonathan Maver was the specialist responsible to handle the rendering, since it was such a key part of the game. Maver started adding features and optimizing the performance. He had to design the game engine to use the CPU to rasterize the 3D, since no 3D hardware was available at the time, kinda like in similarity to what Chris had done in 4D boxing. The way for him to achieve this was by buffering the graphics using anti-aliasing and self-designed special effects. Rick Lambright was also an executive staff member who handled many of the multiplayer aspects of the game. Lambright came over from Starwave and is one of the most creative minds behind Boneyards. Cave Dog's own proprietary online gaming service, and Galactic Wars, an online total annihilation metagame that would become a mark on the game's identity. Lambright came up with a system that gave the possibility of a player to register or play as a guest in the Boneyard service, which gave support to Galactic Wars. The advantages of a registration would allow a player to make part of ladders, to store service records, and to win Galactic War rankings. The ladders for Galactic Wars allow players to measure the skill and strategic prowess against fellow gamers. By rising through the ranks of these ladders, players with established notoriety and fame 
as the Total Annihilation players. There were developed four types of ladder ranks, from the most important to the least. The Duel Ladder, related pretty much with 1 vs 1 matches. The Winner Takes All Ladder, a free for all that could reach around 5 vs 5 players. The Training Ladder, ranks 1 on training missions on planets belonging to a faction. And the Galactic Wars Ladder, attributed to all players registered with Boneyards playing in Galactic Wars. The main goal of Galactic Wars was for each faction to conquer as many planets as possible. Each planet held by a faction would be represented either in blue or red. Uncontested planets would be shown in yellow. As mentioned before, Boneyard players had ranks, clans and many other options available to them. Silverwide, competitions were often held where the top rankings from each side were given the commander status of their side. This was the highest rank and was only gained by winning one of the top competitions. Results against other players counted towards a larger war, determining which side held the various planets which made up the war zone. Each rank value was updated at the end of each day. There were even weekly briefings that could be read directly from Boneyard's dedicated website. This weekly briefing was some kind of a recap, written as a life story in a Star Wars soap opera style, with pretty cool descriptions and analogies of how the planetary conquests occurred between each faction during that week. Here's a print screen of how the Galactic War interface looked when accessed through the Boneyard's executable in the main menu of Total Annihilation. I apologize, but I couldn't get a better resolution image. Total Annihilation has an original orchestral soundtrack composed by Jeremy Soule. Compositions were performed by the 95 Peace Northwest Symphonia Orchestra, also from Seattle. This particular orchestra would end up producing several other famous movies and video game music partitures until this day, such as The Ravenant, The Grunge, World of Warcraft Cataclysm and The Destiny Saga, amongst many others. As for the music composition and adaptation to Total Annihilation, it was defined that it would change according to events. During a battle, a louder and more frantic music would play. While doing post-war damage repair or idle construction, a more ambient and mysterious track would be used. As remembered by Taylor, we came up with the idea early on the music changing tempo, whenever a battle commenced, and created a complex design for how it would work. The basis for the orchestral composition came from classical music influences like Wagner and the Ride of the Valkyries. The Total Annihilation soundtrack is considered to be Soul's first major work as a gaming composer, and worth him his first music award. Soul is considered nowadays the John Williams of video game music. Examples of further music compositions by him are Secret of Evermore, Dungeon Siege, Elder Scrolls Saga, amongst many more. In a more advanced stage of development, Taylor and Kozlovic were also already evolving the game lore to a certain level, more specifically Kozlovic, which explained on his blog how we came up with some of the main ideas for the main game. In the original lore idea, the commanders apparently were identical clones, who were at war due to the factions resulting from the type of laboratory equipment they were created from. One had a regular test tube as part of his insignia, the other one had an Erlenmeyer flask. Kozlovic ideas were drawn through a large BD style storyboard, with all the thing, as we can see on a small excerpt he posted on his blog. The Kozlovic explains that the faction names resulted from a lot of brainstorming between him and Taylor, where they came up with the names like the Syndicate and the Corporation. Apparently, Chris shortened the Corporation to just the core, and unit artist Clayton Corbizia came up with the arm. Since the sound clicked, they kept it. Afterwards, Chris asked Kozlovic to cook up a story on the reason why they were fighting. On the very next day, the story was complete. It was also adapted by veteran game writer Dave Grossman, who adapted to the intro sequence for the final game. The story can be resumed to Core Faction was composed of the previous mortals, whose brilliant minds had been stored on digital simulations for the use of society. As for the arm, it was a group of rebels who feared the immortality and knowledge who lived in the far end of a galaxy. War shattered when the core, with growing fear of a rebellion, outburst, attacked the arm. The little quarrel soon evolved to a total war, which lasted for a thousand years. Most of the original background story was based on two main books, Fearsome Engine by Ian Banks, and the second one was Permutation City by Greg Egan. 
where Koslovic states, Banks deals with a fantastic distant future, where the dead live in a digitalized afterlife, using a fast computer, built into the crust of a planet, while Egan portrays early attempts on digitalizing a human mind, using a more contemporary setting. Both are great reads and influenced my thinking when I went home to cook up that skinny premise to Total Annihilation. Koslovic also explains the basis for the futuristic scenarios created around Total Annihilation, with the influences of two other books, Queen of Angels by Greg Bear and Diamond Age by Neil Stephenson. Queen of Angels has a great segment describing the formation of a building inside what amounted to a gigantic glass jello mold. I thought something like that might fit our super cool futuristic war pretty well. Diamond Age vividly portrays nanotech used in both fabrication and warfare. I proposed the nano lath as the basis for our construction technology. One of the programmers also came up with a particle effect, sort of like a futuristic space bee, and we were all set. Around spring 1997, Total Annihilation was fast approaching his last months of development, and the public would soon have his first contact with the game. Besides some things still missing, there was one that sprang to mind, a name for the team. It wouldn't make much of a sense for a game like Total Annihilation to be released using Yamanga's label, especially due to the connection the company had with the very successful and colorful child games. As Kozlovic recalls in this blog, we'd know from the start that the game couldn't be released under the wholesome, family-friendly Yamanga's label. It would make sense for their audience, or the one we were hoping to reach with Total Annihilation. This didn't stop some of us from drawing pictures of Putput bristling with guns. A new game and a completely different image would be required. Besides brainstorming with Chris, and since nothing was coming up, Kozlovic decided to expand the brainstorming to the whole team. After all the suggestions were gathered, where most of them had the usual mega and soft in the game, some involved rain, fish and mountains, to the location where the Among Us offices were. In the end, Kozlovic and Chris ended up with two possible choices, Cave Dog Entertainment or Frozen Yak Entertainment. Kozlovic draws some sketchy logos and later that day ended up by creating the final version of both. As we all know by now, the final name chosen was Cave Dog Entertainment. Also, as an easter egg, and as mentioned by Kozlovic, a poster of Total Annihilation where we can see the Cave Dog logo could be found in a scene of episode 7 in the second season of The Sopranos. Frozen Yak was also used as an April Fool's prank on a website that can still be accessed today that includes several private jokes such as the Cave Dog changing his name to Frozen Yak Entertainment and most of the games changing for several funny names. On the right we can see the new logos for each of the respective games which by clicking on each of them would lead to a respective description page. Here we could find for instance a description for the really cool war game with a different set and with the trailer and moonshine war between Hatfields and McCoys with some awesome screenshots as well. Really cool war game with trolls, obviously regarding Total Annihilation Kingdoms, also with adapted screenshots and a very nice story-like description, the Raptor Hallelujah Episode 1, a parody for The Awakening, set in St. Patrick's Day 2032, with a ridiculous storyline as well and as usual a cool screenshot, a brand new game called Noir and Blank, an awesome 2D game with no weapons and no storyline, but with a very, very cool introduction video. And a brand new service, the Yakpen Online Gaming, to replace the obsolete Boneyard Gaming service, where the objective was to capture as many trailer parks as possible, to rule the trailer park redneck industry. Also, you could apply for a job. At the time, they were looking for pool cleaners, bronco busters and efficiency experts. You could read the details on the website as usual. It was also in the early 1997 that Cave Dog Entertainment had a place they could call his own. Since the beginning of the studio, the team had been sharing space with several of the Among Us Entertainment team departments, which resulted in the various sections and members of Cave Dog to be scattered in Building A, in what at the time was called Woodenville West Business Park, in the northeast area of Seattle. Cave Dog finally had a building of his own, in Building B, where the team contact interaction was easier and more productive. It was also in this building that Cave Dog finished Total Annihilation and Core Contingency. Cave Dog had great designers and artists, illustrators and 3D animators, which ended up by creating several high quality prints 
to be used for both magazines and website advertising. Fossil Week and Taylor weren't too keen on the usual advertisement games had during the 90s, so they came up with the idea to use the full two pages of the game's magazines. The purpose was for the game to have maximum impact before it was released. In the magazine universe, Cave Dog had one major advantage. GT Interactive owned the advertisement space for the central pages for all the main games magazines from 97. GT Interactive was not really convinced about this double page huge image marketing strategy, but as soon as the advertisements came out, this decision further contributed to distantiate Total Annihilation from other RTS games in presentation. Besides Kozlovic itself, Kevin Punn, Mike Fisher and Jared Holderby are some of the most relevant names which made part of artist side of Cave Dog who produced pre-rendered game printouts, game layouts such as menus, unit and map characterization, among other stuff. Fisher helped to create very detailed and professionally designed units, while Kevin Pun, besides the 3D rendering, would also design the units in a more artsy, elaborate way. On the 3D realm, some of the units created by the team could reach between 2000 and 5000 polygons, which at the time made a huge impact in the quality of the final units. Jared Olderby would then use 3D rendering for both units, drafts and maps and assist in coloring those assets by using KPT Bryce software, which was used to create 3D scenarios. By using PowerMax 8500 and 7600 for every pixel resolution imagery treatment, the artistic treatment applied was used not only for the game assets, but also for the creation of rendered prints for advertisement in magazines. The final result was nothing short than amazing. A note as well for background artists Mark West, Steve Thompson, Casey Burpee and John Barron, who had joined Cave Dog around this time and assisted largely in the design, development and rendering of mission maps, namely trees, rocks, water and several other planetary decoration items. Around March 1997, after Yamungus and Cave Dog had set Total Annihilation to be released in September, they finally had the opportunity to have a writer from PC Gamer that was set to pay a visit to Among Us Cave Dog offices in Woodenville in about a month. During that period, Kozlovic and the team improved some of the graphic aspects of the game, such as the multiplayer skirmish and mission briefing screens changed a lot to the final version, while the mission briefing screen was added some design tweaks and a little bit of depth and gloss. Since this documental project of mine was already taking a lot of time to do, I said screw it, and ended up by doing a small montage using Kozlovic's original briefing screen layout taken from his blog, as usual. What do you guys think? Kozlovic, Ron and Chris came up with a crazy idea of 100 by 100 map divertised as Boris. The idea was for the map to show off the capacity of Total Annihilation game maps in all glory. To try and pull this off, Clay ended up by needing several days to render and assemble Boris, which apparently failed miserably since his PC at the time was a behemoth Pentium 200 with 64 megs of RAM and couldn't handle the task. He did explain in this blog though that the final version would eventually be more like 40x40, 40 40, but since that time the tasks he had was so enormous, he assumed it would have been at least the double of that. Following Clay, Cave Dot ended up by using one of the original maps to show off the game to the mentioned PC Gamer interviewer who showed up in April 1997. After he was shown some gameplay, units, maps and interface, he really got a revolutionary opinion for the game. As shown by Kozlovic, the interviewer ended up by posting an article where he even stated it could be very well the most revolutionary real-time strategy game since Dune 2, a statement that would make the whole team proud. Clay also revealed that in many magazines, Rod Gilbert's name would always show up more than Chris's. This was due to the fact that Ron had already made a name for himself in LucasArts, along with the huge success of games like Monkey Island and Jumanga's Entertainment franchises. But Ron was always gracious and pointed reporters right back to Chris. Ron really believed that the designer should speak for his own game. In a final note on the advertisement, Cave Dog at the time also decided to pre-release some animated screenshots, unit details, and they even had a forum running in the company's website in the months prior and after the game release. All these actions contributed to build hype around the game, which created a large fanbase. A fanbase that grew more and more eager to buy the final product, which was months from being released.
one of the final steps on the game development was related with the videos included in the game. So much emphasis was placed on the game that the intro and cutscenes were left for the last months of development. The main protagonists responsible for the full motion video animations, besides Kozlerik, were Kevin Punn, Rebecca Kaufman, Clayton Corbizier, Steve Thompson and Mark West. It was defined that the game would have an intro, two victory cinematics and a visual reward to be shown each time a level was completed. The intro had to reflect a short idea about the type of war related with the main story of the game. To produce the video, Kevin used the original storyboards which had been designed by Karslovic to create momentum with a slow camera pullback. He also designed some of his own storyboards as a normal director so that it would be easier to keep track of each scene. The movie team also used 3D models which had been created by the team who created the original 3D units for image rendering. Rebecca Kaufman helped to build large shots for the final movie version, which ended up by being much longer than it had originally been designed. The final version still remains today as an epic rendering of the war between the arm and the core. The video would not be complete without mentioning John Patrick Laurie, the awesome narrator we can hear in the intro video and in the briefings. But the glow in the eastern skies was coming from within a massive structure of unknown origin. This was surely the alien device which the Corps commander intended to use. It appeared to be some sort of beacon. The arm would have to capture it first. The survival of the entire galaxy was at stake with a deep and mysterious voice that added to an atmosphere that further helped to spark what players were to expect the total annihilation. The game launch was just around the corner. Total Annihilation launched on the 30th of September 1997. The game received a global marketing effort at launch and was concurrently released in 14 countries with English, French and German localization. By the end of October, the game had already sold 250,000 copies worldwide due to the help of magazine advertisements like PC Magazine's media coverage and Cave Dog website advertisement as mentioned in previous topics which helped to build a very high hype for the game. Right from the beginning and in the following months, Cave Dog and the game fan base would build a mutual bond. The team would be giving full support to the game through live message boards, multiple forums which were managed by resident dogmasters or DMs administrators which would assist the community with any technical issues they could come by. They even came up with Dog Drop, which was Cave Dog newsletter with tips, tricks and offers and units suggest in dedicated area, along with the Ask Commander section, where players could ask funny questions and get even funnier answers from commanders. All of this at the same time the team would be releasing weekly units for free. Before each unit was released, Cave Dog previewed the unit in their website the day before it hit the download section which happened each Friday at midnight. This strategy dramatically increased the hits the site received Thursdays and Fridays at midnight, to a point that in the end of January, Kevdog website was ranking in number 36 in the 100 most popular sites in the world. With each unit release, Kevdog was able to address balance issues with some aspects of the game and unit behavior. For example, the Flecker was released to help fight off large air attacks that could not be defended against with only the Defender units. In the following months, four main patches would be released in response to problems fans were having with the game. In the first couple of months after we released version 1.0 of the game, we read almost every single post on the message board to collect feedback. In the period of the game release, between September of 1997 and in March 1998, Cave Dog would have released a total of 17 new units, several multiplayer maps and three main patches in their website along with Total Annihilation Map and Mission Editor, released in beta state at this time. By the end of March, CaveDog already had a multitude of fan-driven websites, which offered custom maps, missions and patches mirrored from CaveDog website. It was during this period that Chris Taylor decided to leave CaveDog, apparently due to several technical divergences in the game development, a statement that was never fully discussed. CaveDog simply added an update with little to no details where they stated. The total truth. Yes, Chris Taylor has left Cave Dog Entertainment to pursue other opportunities. We will miss him and wish him well. Shortly after Kozlovic accumulated Chris Taylor functions as project lead, things weren't running as smoothly as the team would have desired. 
with core contingency about to be released, another expansion on the works, and other projects that were still to be announced, the team had underestimated how much effort went into making the weekly units. As a result, the releases started being delayed. In April, only maps were released in place of units, and fans started to grow restless, as they felt Cave Dog was straying away from what had made them so popular. At the 23rd of April, Cave Dog announced that the studio would be releasing Battle Tactics expansion in four major games. Total Annihilation Kingdoms, a first-person shooter called Aemon the Awakening, a role-playing game by the name of Elysium, and Ron Gilbert's Good and Evil. On the very next day, 24th of April, unit releases were fully suspended for Total Annihilation, and several updates and justifications were made by Ron Gilbert that would further shape the coming months of Cave Dog and Total Annihilation franchise. We were hoping to get all the details together before we made any official announcement about Total Annihilation 2, but since it seems to be a hot topic, I thought it might be best to let everyone know now that we have not abandoned Total Annihilation 2, far from it. The fact that we decided not to quickly crank something out from this holiday season is a testament to that. Cave Dog Entertainment is committed to creating only the highest quality games. Our plans are to give the project the time it needs in order to make the advances, not only in technology, but also in gameplay, to take it to the next level in RTS games. As soon as we're sure of dates and features, we will let everyone know. As far as the download units, stopping them was not an easy choice for us to make. We talked about it for weeks and kept putting one more unit as we struggled with the decision. But a fact remains that we really need to move on and focus on the next DA games. We thought now would be a good time, because Total Annihilation Core Contingency is coming out and there are 75 new units to be had. Fans who visit Cave Dog's website have always been very important to us. You influence many of the directions we take, which has never been more true than today. In fact, I and most everyone at Cave Dog, right after we got our daily latte, this is Seattle after all, go to the website and read through all the posts. Ron Gilbert, Cave Dog Entertainment. Core Contingency Expansion was released on the 30th of April 1998, along with Patch 3.0. This expansion contained 25 new missions and a new story context, 75 new units, a more responsive map editor, which was already becoming a trademark for the Cave Dog community since its original release, multiple maps and missions had already been created by fans. The second and last expansion, Battle Tactics, was released on the 30th of June only two months later, along with the final patch for Total Annihilation, Patch 3.1, which now allowed players to select any mission of any campaign right from the start of the game, replacing the famous Dot to Death bone sheet that could be accessed in the main menu of the game. Unit limit was now also available above the 200 limit. This last expansion received lower ratings and mixed opinions compared to the previous one. Many gamers, which were loyal to our original gameplay methods, this liked how many of the scenarios eliminated resource management as a critical component of the game, since its revolutionary economy system is part of what made Total Annihilation unique and popular at the time. Though this last entry had 100 new missions, an acid and crystal worlds for the first time, 4 new units and 6 multiplayer maps, was heavily criticized due to its short and limited gameplay and the single player mission, which ironically was one of the main features of the expansion. After the release of Battle Tactics, during the second half of 1998 and during the next year, Cave Dog would release the last six units for Total Annihilation and the last one would come out as late as in 2000. After June 1998, Cave Dog would focus on the development of Boneyard's multiplayer interface and on game titles, which had previously been announced by Ron Gilbert in late April. Boneyard's beta testing will launch the general public on the 12th of November 1998 and will launch its final version on the 8th of April of 1999, two months before Kingdoms was released. From all four games, only two would remain in development in 1999, being Aemon and Kingdoms, and from those two, only Kingdoms would end up by actually being released. Total Annihilation Kingdoms was based on a much more enhanced version of the Total Annihilation engine the game promised a great storyline and had showcased stunning visuals and renderings made by Cave Dog Team along the months it was under development. Besides the regular interviews and previews with magazines, Kingdoms also showcased a new TA game at Gen Con 1999, where it could be seen several fans around the booth 
designed to showcase the game, we had the chance to try in first hand the so-called greatest fantasy game of all time. When Total Annihilation Kingdoms was released on the 25th of June of 99, besides all the hype and expectation, many fans complained that the game ran slowly on all but the most powerful machines, rendering it virtually unplayable. The units were poorly balanced and multiplayer had seemingly taken a step backwards, while the AI was indistinguished as in the original Total Annihilation. Despite debuting very high on the charts, Kingdoms quickly dropped in popularity and word spread of the game's problems in balance and performance, even after multiple patches were released during the second half of 1999. To make matters worse, during this time, GT Interactive had been blocked by infogrames due to severe game selling losses, some of them caused by Kingdoms. As a bonus, let me just throw the top 10 reasons for not to buy Kingdoms. Bear in mind, Cave Dog had discontent laying around on the old website. On the 6th of January 2000, Cave Dog announced that Aim and the Awakening had been cancelled, and that the company would be focusing only on Total Annihilation and Boneyard's products. This was also the official press release made by Cave Dog Entertainment. First person shooter Aim and the Awakening cancelled, studio to shift efforts to Total Annihilation franchise and Boneyard's online community. 6th of January 2000. The company plans to cease development of the first person action game Aim on the Awakening. The change in development direction will allow Cave Dog Entertainment to successfully grow its better established brand and provide an opportunity to create highly anticipated products such as Total Annihilation 2, the third title in the Total Annihilation franchise. Besides some pictures and several interviews which were given by Ron Gilbert about Aim on the Awakening, a teaser full motion video of about 30 seconds could still be found around the internet. Let's see how the game atmosphere could have looked. At 11 February 2000, Cave Dog was discarded by Umangas. Total Annihilation Kingdoms, The Iron Plague, was released on the 6th of March 2000. The expansion added a faction and different storyline campaign to the original game, and was released when both Cave Dog and GT Interactive no longer existed as the original developer and publisher. Umangas Entertainment changed to Umangas Incorporated when Infogrames was merged by Atari in 2006. The company still operates to this day by selling adaptations of the original entertainment games for children. Not the most important aspect, but the relevant one. Throughout this first half an year after launch and in the following years, Total Annihilation will receive countless video game industry awards. As an example, Best Strategy Game, Best Multiplayer Game, Best Music Game, Game of the Year 97, amongst many more to refer here. Throughout the late 90s and the last two decades, a huge community has built up around Cave Dog's classic RTS, principally to promote online play and modding, whether if it be scenarios, maps or units. At its peak, there were several of Total Annihilation super sites, such as Planet Annihilation, TA Designers and TA Universe. As an example, thousands of new custom units and maps were designed by eager fans, while the most impressive work remains the 70 plus full mods. Two worth mentioning are TA Escalation and TA Annihilation Zero. Both mods are still very active in development and updating even today. There are also free engine and game remakes worth mentioning. Spring Engine, an open source general public license engine made for the creation of real-time strategy games and is based on Total Annihilation. The engine is a multi-platform and features Lua scripting to make almost every aspect of the game customable. It even features online, LAN and offline playing. Fully 3D combat with a physics engine. An example of a game that uses this engine being showcased is Zero K. Total Annihilation 3D is a fan-made 3D real-time strategy game engine created with the purpose of directly moving Total Annihilation over to a three-dimensional plane. The engine has a Microsoft Windows and Linux version and is programmed in OpenGL and C++. 
The main focus is to recreate the engine and gameplay of Total Annihilation by using his original 3D game assets. It also supports a range of mods. TA3D has been in development now for over 15 years. The most recent update is from 2017, where the remake engine was adapted for 64-bit processors. Robot War Engine RWE, is an open-source real-time strategy game engine that is highly compatible with Total Annihilation data files. It is intended to replicate what Total Annihilation does with Total Annihilation data but without some of the limits the base game has. RWE has progressed through several stages with descriptive names such as Menu Simulator 5000, Map Viewer Extreme and Commander Laser Battle Arena. It is currently still in unfinished pre-alpha development stage, although you can already download a working version with very limited features. The remaining super site, TAUniverse.com, is the number one TA resource, boasting a busy forum and thousands of downloadable mod items. You can even still play the game online today. One thing is for sure, Total Annihilation is a game that will always remain as a revolutionary franchise in the RTS genre, a major inspiration for generations to come. After leaving Cave Dog, Chris founded Gas Powered Games in 1998, where he developed games like Dungeon Siege Saga, Supreme Commander Saga, Space Siege and Age of Empires Online. In 2013, Gas Powered Games was purchased by Wargaming.net. Chris left in 2016 to found Kanuji, a game platform whose first game is a browser game called Intergalactic Space Empire. After Cave Dog closure, Clay founded a third-party developer studio called Beep Games for Microsoft Xbox. The first game developed was Voodoo Vince, which was followed by Flying Leo in 2005 and Zodiac in 2006. Amongst many other games, Clay worked back with Chris Taylor on Supreme Commander Forged Alliance in 2007 and with Ron Gilbert in 2010 on Dead Spank. 2017 Voodoo Vince was remastered. Clay is currently creative director at Microsoft Game Studios. He also runs a blog, which I used as a basis for this video. You should check it out. After leaving Cave Dog, Ron co-founded Hulabi Entertainment Incorporated with Shelley Day, where they kept releasing children's games between 2001 and 2003. Ron also worked on Beep Games between 2004 and 2007, along with Kay Klausowicz. He would also work with Clay between 2008 and 2011, as creative director at Vancouver-based Hothead Games Development Studio, where he assisted designing Dead Spank game series. In 2013, he worked as director on a game called The Cave for development Double Fine Production Studio. Also, since 2014, Ron has been working with studio Terrible Toybox, serving as a writer, designer and programmer on a game called Timbleweed Park, a spiritual successor for Maniac Mansion and The Secret of Monkey Island series. Ron also has a blog-like website which I can't recommend enough, where he shows his personal and game developer experiences. 